In terms of structured data, we kind of touched on this as we went through the spec, but I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go in and just go to go through it a little bit more because I think it's important. Um, if you've got a question on something, and in a number of cases people have come up, we talk about some things. Go into the into the spec and go to this resources tab. Uh, I use alphabetical, but use whichever works for you, uh, and go and look up the uh, particular resource that you're interested in. So I, I, I use patient as an example of that, and I just want to show you the the key parts. So did I actually have I already talked to this? I can't remember. My brain is gone. Okay. Um, but I, th I just want to point out the, the these are the, the fixed define uh, properties. These are flags for special things, so whether it's something which is a, what we call a modifier element, cardinality there, data type there, um, and bindings. So if I've already done that, I'll carry on. Data types. I, 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 I sort of talked about data types a little bit earlier on when we were talking about the information model and we went over some just a small number. I, I, I want to go through them in a little bit more detail uh, and a p couple of particular ones I wanted to call out. You will see when you look into the spec there are these things called backbone elements. So they are ones where you have a resource and that resource has got, uh, well in this case it's contact and it has a set of child elements like that almost always, except for a couple of places, that's a naught to many thing. So what this is saying is that a patient can have any number of contacts. Each contact can have a relationship, a name, a telecom, and so forth. The other one to call out, which often confuses people, is this X element here. We call this a choice element. Uh, for those who are IT folk, this is like a polymorphic element. And what it is it's a it's a, an element where there can be more than one data type. In this particular case, deceased can either be a boolean, indicating the patient is deceased or not, uh, and a deceased date time. You can have one or the other. The element name will change according to the data type that you select. David, so, do you want to explain the boolean to people who don't know what that is? Right. So a, a boolean can be Sorry. either be true or false. Sorry, if I go into techie, pick me yeah, up. I, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so boolean is true or false, zero or one is two options. Yeah, can either be true or false, whereas a, a date time, of course, is, is, a, is a date. So they were the ones I wanted to call out. Um, here is just, so you don't have to memorize this at all, but there's a couple of reasons why I wanted to show it to you. I wanted to point out the fact that we have two data types. One is what we call primitive data types. And a primitive data type is something which just has a value. So it's time, it's date, it's, um, you know, it's a URI, it's a string, it's an integer, so on and so forth. It has one and one value only. And then the second one are these complex data types. And this, I suspect, to me, this looks like a thing of beauty. Uh, I, I suspect that others might look at it and think that it's a little bit more complicated than that. But it's actually quite simple, particularly if, if you've been involved in, in other specifications. Um, th this is all there is, uh, and a complex one has got child elements. So if you look at a codable concept there, you can see that a codable concept has got a coding element, and that coding element is itself of data type coding, i.e. that guy there, and you can see that it's naught to many. In other words, you can have multiple codings inside of a codable concept. I'm going to talk about that one in just a, just a second more. And notice, however, there's also a string element in codable concept. And then the other ones is that we've got address, we've got attachment, and so on and so, so forth. So David, a, a primitive con co concept has just a value, one value. Yeah. Whereas a complex one has more than one parameter to it. A primitive one has more than one value. Yeah. So, so yeah. I will. I'll come to that in just a sec. I'll kind of. I'll kind of carry on. Um, identifiers. Uh, an identifier is a particular data type you should be aware of. It's something like an NHI or a driver's license or a health health provider index or something like that. It has sub co sub components of a system and a value. Now, the reason why I hurried on is here are where your examples sit. So. Um, I want to talk about coded elements in particular. In Fire, we have three and a half coded elements. 
The first one is this code. And there's an example there. A code is really like a string. So often a status, uh, the set of possible values for codes are almost all defined in the specification. And they're almost all required. And we use them for structural type things, like a, uh, a, a, like a status um, is the most common, common use for that. The next one we have is the coding data type. Here's an example of a coding. This is in JSON. And as you can see, it's got a system. And the system refers to the terminology from which this code is drawn. I'll talk about that in a second. There's the code. And there's the display. So that is the display of that code in that system. It is fixed by the system. You can't change it. Then we have the codable concept. And the codable concept is made up of uh, naught or more codings and a text element. This is far and away the most useful coded element. And you'll see that most of the coded elements that are in the spec and indeed that you will use in your profiles will be of type codable concept. And the reason is that because coding is multiple, this allows you to have codings from different code systems. So you might have a single concept, like ASMA, and code it from SNOMED and code it from LOINC, uh, if it is appropriate to do so. The second reason why it's so useful is that the multiplicity of the coding element is naught to many. It is perfectly valid in FIRE to have a codable concept value which has no codings but has just text. So by definition, the text is supposed to be the text that the clinician entered when the coding was, was done or selected from the list. But in real life, often you'll have, you'll have information which isn't coded. Should be, but isn't coded. So what the codable concept allows you to do is to at least say, this thing should be coded. But if you don't have the code, at least give us the text. It's that, con that concept of incremental interoperability. So the codable concept is... Um, uh, is that one. Would anybody care to take a guess as to what the half may be? It's a really, really complicated question and there's a very valuable prize if anybody actually gets it. The half is. There's a half. You mentioned it as the three and a half. The three and a half. The answer is no one will know and I want to keep my prize. It's quantity. So there is a quantity data type, which is a quantity of thing. It has units and the units are coded. So that's the half, usually from UCOM. In the, case of, um, in the case of quantity. The value set. The value set, we've kind of touched on the value set um, as, we've, as we've kind of gone through the day. It's one of the more important resources, particularly in terms of, of, of coded type data. And what it does is it provides a specific subset of data out of a uh, out of a code system of some sort, a specific set of SNOMED codes, a specific set of LOINC codes, and so forth. Its purpose is to promote consistency between applications. So when you're collecting stuff in a context, it helps you say, here's the list of preferred terms I'd like you to use. So in New Zealand, for example, we create an ED value set, the most common diagnoses in ED, to help an ED supplier provide consistent codes, but yet go beyond it if they need to. And we'll talk about how to do that in a second. And this is the sort of thing that clinicians are going to have a big input into because it's you guys who know where these codes are going to come from and it's you guys who are going to actually indicate what are the contents of these code systems. Um, it's used by a number of services, uh, which we've actually seen before, but we'll see again in just a second, um, called Expand. That's an example of a value set. Do you, sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. Yo. Is this the same as a SNOMED ref set, or are you talking? Very similar. It's not the same, but the principle is the same. Sets of values. A value set is a set of values. It's a subset. But you could have a value set which was a SNOMED ref set. You can. Yeah, yeah there, are, there are a number of... And in fact, actually, within, within FIRE, I'm, I'm not a deep terminologist. You can actually you know, make sort of queries directly, SNOMED, SNOMED type queries. I'm kind of not going into them, staying at the, at the upper level. I want to talk a little bit more about how that works. And again, I'm, I suspect that this audience might already know this stuff anyway. A lot don't, so that's why I go through it. So you start with a code system. And the code system is where your concepts are defined. 
obvious examples being Snowmed or, as I said, Loink, ICD, or Custom. Fire actually allows you to define your own set of code systems if you want to. Obviously, it's not a preferred way of doing things, but the option is there. And the value set then selects the set of codes for a particular purpose, for a reason. Um, a single value set can have bindings to more than one code system, if that is appropriate for your particular use case. And it's not uncommon to have a value set in the spec which has a, a set of codes from, say, Loink, and then a couple of others that have been added to round it out. Often they do come from the same code system, but you don't have to. These are the sorts of things that you will absolutely be defining in, in Care Connect and in your own in your own domain. So is gender a good example of a value set? Agenda would be a good example of a value set. We'll, uh, we'll have a look at that one in just a second. Um, we then have the concept of binding. So from a uh, an elements definition in the spec or in a profile, you then bind that element to a value set. And that binding has got a strength. And that binding strength effectively indicates how, how much a particular instance can deviate from your value set. And it goes from a required binding, which means that an instance must have a result from this value set to be conformant, uh, all the way through to example, which means that we actually don't know what the heck to do. Here's something which looks like it could be. There's four, there's four sets of bindings. When you're doing your profiling, you would create your value set and you determine the binding to be used. Think very carefully about using a required binding uh, because, of course, it does limit the ability to which you can interoperate. It's more common to use something like a preferred uh, binding, which is where you're saying, please, please, please use this set if you possibly can. If you have no other option, then give us what you've got. And then a particular instance down here can then have a, a value of a coded element that refers to the code system. Does not refer to the value set, it refers to the code system. And it can then be claimed to be conformant to the particular profile from which it came. And so what you sort of see is that you have these parts around here that are sort of definitional parts. Here's where you say, here's my profile, here's the value set that I want to use. Um, in order to be conformant, but the instance still refers back to the code system. So if we go and... Does everyone understand? That's a bit complicated. Does everyone understand that? No. Yeah? No? So, give an example so, of the so the instance, remember, is the popula is data that's being used specifically, yeah. carrying data from that profile, we say, well, these are a bunch of values that I can have. This is the definition of my resource. It can have this, it can do this. But the instance is, I'm actually now going to populate it. So that one there, right? in the scenario builder, that would be an instance of condition. Yeah. And it has a value. There's a number of ways I can look at it, but I'm going to show you this one right here. So there it is. It has a particular clinical status, has non-zet date, time, and so on. So it's an instance yeah. for one patient with a, with a given set of values. And when David said it's conformant, he, so, he's using the term saying that it meets the definition of the overall resources, i.e. it's conformant to it. Yeah. That's a fire term, some yeah. of the jargon I have to explain. I can't help it. <laughs> so let's go and have a look, and I think you mentioned patient gender. So I can now come back with that background, I can now come back to the spec. And you will see that there are a number of um, gender, I think we agreed to do, didn't we? Uh, there it is there. So it's actually a code. So you'll see it's optional. Notice how there is the value set. You can click on all the value sets and it will expand them as much as it possibly can. So this is the possible set of values. And I will draw your attention to the fact it is a required binding. So what that means is that according to the specification, the gender must be one of these four and these four values only. It is possible to go more detailed than that, so for example a transgender person, but you do that by creating an extension against this particular element. Question, uh, yeah. It's just a, a picky point. 
within NHS and within UK, that value set isn't the value set which is used. You have no option. Therefore, we need to go into a record. It would have to be mapped and translated. So, and I think it's an important point. I'm glad you brought it up. The if it is a required binding, then to be conformant, to, to, to claim to be a fire resource, you, you actually have to use one of that four. Now, if it doesn't match the four that you're already using, you have three options. The first option is to go back to the committees and get the value set changed. The second option is to kind of do what you've said, is to create a mapping. And effectively what you do when you map like this is you say, I want to represent a transgender individual who was female to male. And no, you it, it's actually the, it's the numeric. It's a numeric value set. It's not a textual value set. Oh, it, you, you, well, you're definitely going to have to do mapping there. And there's a resource for that called Concept Map, incidentally. But, I've, but, I've, but it's, a, it's a really good point because it, this whole issue of a required binding is, is really, really important. Um, and the third thing you can do is not use fire. I'd recommend against that if at all possible, but, but so that's what, that's what a required binding does. Um, so yes, in, in your scenario you'll need a, there's a resource called a concept map and that concept, concept map maps between code systems which is exactly what you would do here. But you may well find, sorry the circumstance that I was talking about before, where you have something that simply doesn't map and there is a solution to that which is the extension mechanism. Sorry, I saw a hand. No, 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 no. no. So da da David, in the workshop that we had, yeah. so male, female, other unknown, underneath that it gives you a link. Now that link in the file takes you to the value sets. Yep. It just so happens there it also shows you on the top level what those were, but that hyperlink takes you to some more detail about it. Right? So if you go back, it just so happens that above that it does actually show you the values. Yes, it, it, it won't always do that, but, but it will. So, it will sometime. yeah. sometimes it does. The zero to one again we've covered. What, just for the sake of um, argument, if it didn't have required, if it was preferred, would it say preferred in brackets? It says required now. Extensible. So take this one here, take yeah. marital status codes. This is extensible. If you click on the link there, you'll get a description of, uh, of what these things actually mean. And you can see the thing from requirement. requirement there we go. There, shall, and then extensible, then preferred, and then example. So those are the different parameters around. But they're the, the different sets. strengths. Strengths of the values of, of bindings. Of bindings, yeah, yeah. Okay, so any questions on that? Sorry. No, no, no. I like questions. Yes, I'm a bit too techy. Uh, in what you're talking about coding sets, um, Fire talks you almost universally about URIs, uh, yep. links. Yep. In England, in NHS England, we've widely used OIDs as being coding reference, which are allowed. It was just commentary on defining URN as OID rather than as URI. You, you can, you certainly can use an OID. Um, we don't like them very much because they, um, they're kind of hard to read, uh, but you absolutely can if you need to. You, as you probably know, a URI, a, I'm sorry, a, uh, an OID can be made into a URI, so you can use OIDs. And if you already have them and you're using them, fairly obviously that's what you use. Well, uh, you, you, you use those ones then, yeah. You don't have to change. I, I know that sounded Klingon, <laughs> and it is, so just, <laughs> you don't need to remember what that is if you're oh. a clinician in the room. Uh, surely everybody knows what an oid is. Yeah. Uh. That definitely is Klingon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a level of detail that you really don't need to know, uh, put it that way. It's just a reference. Okay, so I, I wanted to... Um, so with that kind of background, so we've talked about structured data, we've talked about coded data, I just kind of wanted to take you through how you can um, add that information into the scenarios that you are building. And you do that... So when we, um, if you recall, each time we click on a particular resource like asthma, we get the um, uh, individual um, elements from here. So if I click on something which is uh, of a coded data type, so I click on so condition.code, it's a codable concept, I've got a couple of options. 
This is the value set binding now. So this is the definition of the binding. I can select that up, and then I can get details of what it is. I can look at the various parts of it. You can see that it's an isa of that, if for those who are terminologists. Um, I can look at the actual contents of the, uh, of the thing which are in there. And you can see here, here's a good example. So this particular value set consists of all of those concepts from SNOMED which have an ISA relationship to that, um, that ID. And then one more has been added, which is no problems or, or disability. So that allows you to create a single condition that says the patient hasn't got any conditions. Personally, I think that's nuts, but that's, that's what is allowed to, to do. But the other thing that you can do is you can now run what we call expansions. So let's type in asthma and expand that. So what has happened now behind the scenes is uh, I, uh, the, 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 the tooling has gone, has called the expand operation against the terminology server. And you may remember that I talked at the beginning about ClinFire how it has three different kinds of server. So what this, this is actually run, I think it's, I can't quite see my screen to be completely honest with you. Um, if we look at the bottom of that, it should, there's quite a few of them that have come up. So it's actually run, oh, no, I don't, I don't show the URL. Um, oh, there it is, sorry, there it is. So that's the actual query that's been run. So for the technical folk amongst us, um, that query was all I had to do to ask the terminology server to give me all of the codes which have asthma in their name. Now, anyone who's done terminology will know that stuff's hard. It's hard to work through, particularly with some of the more complex uh, ontologies like, uh, like SNOMED is, but all of that complexity can be hidden behind a simple operation. That's all I had to do. I make that call, I get results back, job done. What we're seeing here is the value of setting up these services, the terminology ones are the obvious ones to do, and making them widely available to anybody who uses them, because you start to encourage good practice. You start to make it easy for developers uh, and vendors to actually do this coding by providing those, those operations. Something I'd definitely urge that you look into. And with that in mind, what that means is that I can now go to my codable concept. I can say I want asthma. In this case, I pause a bit and I get that back. And I'll select the one that I want. Click on Save. And I've now added coding to my um, to my, my resource instance. So, so can you remind people why this, where this is coming from, the value set? So this is coming from um, <laughs> STU3's... So where, what, where is it defined here it, that it you is, know it's coming from? It is defined in the specification. So if I go to resources and I go to condition there uh, and I go to code there. So what that is telling me is that is the binding that's in the specification. Uh, it so is an a, example. It's an example strength, which means we can change it. Um, and so the terminology server can take that value set and can then expand it for me. And it can do more than that. It can step up and down hierarchies and do other, other cool stuff as well. So if, so if you click on that, it will tell you it's coming from the SNOMED there it, a call systems from SNOMED. CT. Yep. Yeah. So it's coming, it's actually using the entirety of SNOMED CT uh, as an example. Well, it's not, no, it's not the entirety. In this case, it's, so the, it's oh, the codes the concept where, there which, are, which are a clinical finding. So that's the relationship to the values that it's but, allowing you to choose from as yeah, an example. As an example. But that's the key point, is that one of the things that you will be doing in, in profiling is to decide what value set you use for your items. You may well just leave it as it is, that's absolutely fine, but you have the option to create your own profiles with your own bindings. So, so earlier when we talked about logical modeler, is that option exist in the logical modeler yeah. to put that in? Yeah. It, would it be helpful for people at some point, it, will you come back to that to show how that's done? Because some people are finding that logical modeler is a good place to do their so modeling and if you want to do that there so you, where would you do that in the logical modeler and you go to the logical modeler this works for for all models um, I don't know who Kathy test is but we'll uh, grab that one for a second um, what have we got in here that's codable observations there we go 
Um, so if I wanted to, and that's made to be an observation. So, so that's an observation resource. You can see it's a link to it as a reference. So it's the right heading to the right resource. Yeah. So I can add code to it. And if you remember from what we looked at this morning, it knows what the thing is. And there is where I can select the value set. So if I want to, if I happen to know what the URL is, I can type it in directly here. Or if I know that this value set exists on my terminology server, I can do a find operation. Um, so I've got to put some search text in, I suppose. Um, I can ask for all the there we go, condition cause codes. Let's do that one just for the sake of argument. I can expand it and take a look at it and see what's inside it. So, so Dave is def looking for the types of value sets yeah, that he can pick from. Uh, yep, and I've obviously picked one that's got a lot in it, which was possibly a mistake to make. Um, if I click on the select button there, I've now bound that different value set to observation.code. So, and I can, I can, oh, sorry, I went past it a little bit. Let me go. Um, let me do that again. So, I'm going to find a value set which has cond in its name. It looks like I might have broken the server. Do what's happening here? David, as, as the fire guy, yeah. if I've got a resource through clean fire, I have a, a real world problem. I need to share some of this uh, developing value sets with my clinical yeah. colleagues. If, as long as I can make that value set available on an internet facing web page through clean fire, as the, the fire guy, if you like, yeah. I can share that value set. You can, although it's, it's pretty basic. Um, for some reason, I'm just having some trouble connecting to the happy server. Let's just see how we go on. There is a value set explorer there, which lets you choose a value set. I think... Now, what's happening here to me in front of you all is I think that the happy server has got a problem. Yeah. So, okay, so this is always a pain because we're talking to a public server out there on the internet, and for whatever the reason, that server is no longer available. If that happens, Clean Fire stops dead in its tracks and baths, which is really kind of sad. There's a couple of ways around it, and this is incidentally why, if you are going to get serious about using this sort of stuff, you really should think about setting up your own servers. And you should also be thinking about putting security and a few other bits and pieces in there. So this is really just an intro. And this is actually quite a nice way of saying the stuff that can go wrong in practice. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to here. And I'm going to go and I'm going to select a server, which is on oh, local. There we go. So I'm going to click Save. Set all the same. So what I've now done is I've now said I want to point ClinFire at a fire server running on my local machine. And I can press that little question mark, and that's not working either, which is great. Uh, uh, isn't that the public happy one? No, that's not working either. No, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, you, thank yeah. you. Thank you. OK, it is working. Thank you for that. Sorry. Thank you, Amir. I, I did that deliberately just to, just to show you how it would work. Um, OK, so that's now working. So now everything will work OK, but the of course, the artifacts I was creating before are on another server. They're not on this one. So I, everything still works, but I'll only see stuff which is on my local server. So if I go and go to my value set explorer, actually, what's, since we're talking about that, sorry, can I just be a little bit difficult? Because I might choose, since we're talking about servers, there's a really cool server called Onto Server. And this is the one that uh, the guys in Australia have done. And in theory, I should be able to go into here. So I, I'm now I, I'm now looking at the Onto server, like so. Click on Find, and here are all the um, the, the value sets that have been created. There's the condition one there, um, and I can I can uh, do my uh, expansions against that. So there's that's running. So and notice how. The application ClinFire hasn't changed, but I've used a completely different server for doing terminology operations, complex stuff. What you're seeing 
is where fire comes in. You're seeing the value of APIs. Helps you recover from really embarrassing situations. The other thing that uh, you can do, coming back to your question about value sets, is I can create a new value set. Um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Amir. I should call it Care Connect, shouldn't I? Keeping the branding going, yeah, you know, fine. that sort of stuff. Um, check, the, check that the name uh, doesn't already exist. So again, I'm talking to um, talk that. I'm going to create a brand new value set. Uh, and I'm going to do a search for asthma, so again I'm doing my um, thing, so again I'm making, this one's making a, again an expand call, I'll select asthma, um, and I can add it, I called it as a branch, but this would add it as an as-is filter if you wanted to. But what's cool about um, Onto Server is it allows me to jump up and down the hierarchy of SNOMED. So I've got asthma as a concept, this concept here, but it has a number of children like mixed asthma. So I can select that one, and I now get, I've jumped down the tree. And there's only, there are no children, there's only a parent. So this allows me to jump up and down the tree, uh, if I go to childhood asthma, go down to it, and it only has one parent as well. I was actually trying to add, find a, um, find something that has... So some people may not know fully about the snowmed and the hierarchy thing, so just so, so we might confuse... I think have I, have I, sorry, have I confused people in my so enthusiasm? What, I think what we should do is just help people understand about taking the value set and linking it to the logical model again okay. and just help them understand that because they want to create logical models and you've talked about that. So can you just give us so, one time? Sometimes you're so boring. So, um, so, okay, so okay. For, for, other than the terminologists, forget what I just said. Yeah. So, um, just, if you go so back to the logical it was, model. It was his fault. He made I me know, create I, a new value I, set. Right. Yeah, yeah, we'll okay. talk about him later. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. <laughs> so just to, just to reinforce that thing at the, at the logical model, whether it's information model or whatever, what, if you know what your value set is, uh, I've kind of lost. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, go to my so we're building model. a logical model. We, we want got, to define we, an EE discharge and... Yep. We uh, want to say from problems, for example. Yeah. So here's here's a um, adverse drug reaction, which I'll just choose it at random since it's already there. Okay. Right. So um, we want to click a list of substances, right? Yep. That come from, let's say, C SNOMED CT. If you go up to substance, the, the substance there. Right. I know. Uh, uh, is that a reference to? Uh, that one there is a reference to medication statement. Okay, that's fine. So and within so, medication statement. Oh, so I'm sorry, I've clicked on the wrong link. Yeah. That's getting a bit tired. Um, I can now add an element, and that element is going to be the um, medication statement code, or the reason yeah. code, just a reason code for sake of argument. And here, by, by default, it's linked to this value set, condition code. So that's all s already set up. It's, it's already set up. automatically linking yep. to what the international profile would link it to. This is what the, the core specification says that it comes from condition code. The reason code for a medication comes from the condition code value set. So could we see what's in that? Uh, not Are we able this? to expand that in here to see what's in mm, that? We, we would have to actually go into the... I haven't got that functionality in there. We'd have okay, to actually go right. into here. If I go and select it here... Okay, so here are all the things that have got condition code. Um, <coughs> outcome codes, category codes, cause codes, stage. That's fine. So if it's uh, not there at the moment. There's a condition code. So you'd have to go to the... Okay. Okay, and then... And it's under expand. Yep, under expand there. And there's expand. And, and I can type in... Can you expand all of it to see it? Yep. So you've just expand... Okay. I'm just trying to help people to understand where would they find the content if they didn't. Could they find it in here, or well, would they have to go to the international spec? Yeah, the thing is, uh, the problem is that if you're starting to get detailed about actual value sets, you need to understand what the value sets are. Yeah. So this is where the connection between the yeah. clinical guy and the fire guy, or the terminologist in this case, yeah. start to get get a bit, bit, bit. Um, so this is going to happen for some people. So. In other words, if it happens for some people, if you've got, if you're, if you're creating a code of the element, but you don't know what the value set is, then the way to the way to go forward. Let me just cancel this, and I'll go back to here and I'll create. There's a way to go back to this international. 
Yeah, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new element, and I'm going to call the element Amir, and I'm going to say that it's actually a coded element. So it's, it's a codable concept. It's a codable concept, which means I'm sorry, yes, yeah, so, but, but it's a coded type, yeah. which means that I can select a value set, but I don't know what that value set is. Yeah. I don't know where it is. I don't know how to find it. I'm not a terminologist. In this case, what you should do here is say, um, let, well, let's make it something slightly more sensible. Um, substance, which is the. Um, uh, no, I've, sorry, my brain is stopping at this point. So put in a description of what it is that you're trying to do here. Um, should be a list of things that go bump in the night. Okay, so make a note of what this thing should be. Save it, because what that does is that indicates here that you have created a codable thing. Which, and you've given it a... Uh, an idea yep. and as to what those things will be. Create it or find it. Correct. And then you can go away, create it or find it, and then come back yeah. and put it in if you need to. Now, now, if you had an element for which it was in the international spec, it would be carried over if you identified the right element in the mapping. Correct. And then you, if you wanted to find out what that was, you could go to the fire specification and look at that in, in detail. Yeah, that would probably be the easiest way. Right. So to take the example that we were just talking about, medication statement, um, you go to any um, any code. The other way you can so do medication, it, there we go, medication. Medication, SNOMED, CT codes. So I think we'll find if we go into there, we get... Just it should say at the top. Uh, where yeah. it comes from. Oh yeah, where it comes from, but there's a, there's the expansion of it down there. So it comes from... Yeah. Um, this is, this value is, uh, where does it say? There we go, further. Current logical there definition. Yeah. There it is. So that's where you would find what's contained in those value sets. I think the point we're try I'm trying to make is we're going to down to that level of detail where you've defined the element in your resource, you know what you what you want, now you need to know exactly what you can pick from you know there are some bindings we've discussed. What you pick from, you yeah. can decide if the if the fire spec allows you, like for example, it says example, we can do your own, or it might say it's preferred or required, for which you would use the spec to understand what that means. So there is a degree of flexibility under preferred and example, but if it's required, you have no flexibility. Yeah. John. So I hope it's a hypothetical question. So what if it's required and the international spec says something that doesn't relate to UK requirements? So for instance, for drugs, we have a UK drug dictionary, DM and D. Okay. So we no, I can talk. So um, no, right, no, no. So that doesn't wouldn't apply in this case. So right. that was actually the comment we were talking about earlier on. So a for a required binding, it must come from the set of values, you cannot change it. You can extend it. So I'll go back to my gender one, for example. So remember that gender is like administrative gender. So this person is a female to male um, transsexual. So the, the gender would probably be male. And then you can create an extension to that, which is uh, female to male uh, transsexual. But the actual value of the element itself would be male. Now, that's used rather sparingly in the spec, because you can do it but it's klutzy. And it's usually only used for those things where the committee feels it is so important that we're talking about the same thing that they set it to be required. So it's used very sparingly. As far as I'm aware in the spec, the only place it is used is against various status type code elements. You've got a verification status there, which a, um, a system may not be able to contain that bit of information. And you've got a condition at the top, which is the information that is produced. And the system may be able to store that information. So when you use that as a send record request, you would get the condition. But you wouldn't get the verification status that said that it was refuted. So you would get, you would get a piece of information that said the opposite to what was actually the case. Um, 
I guess that's theory. I mean, I, so I'm sorry. I guess that's 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 possible. Um, I would I would suggest that a system that sent you a condition it knew to be incorrect without saying that it was incorrect is a system that I wouldn't want to deal with myself. Um, you may decide that that's too risky for you and make the verification status required, in which case a system that doesn't store that can't send you anything. So it's like anything else, phase and balances. So, and I think there'd be an expectation that if you're being sent something and it doesn't have a, 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 a verification status, that it, at least it exists. This is the behavior of a system. So fire as a specification can't or shouldn't say, this is how you must operate. That's for your own internal implementation guys to decide. If, imagine if fire did do that. Imagine if fire had that rule to say, um, if you know something, you must send it. What happens if there's a privacy problem around that? Somewhere in the world, someone's going to have an issue with that. So we, we can't dictate that. All we can do is say, here are the mechanisms you can use. It's up to you to decide what's ex acceptable behavior in your ecosystem and then document it and then you know, enforce it by whatever mechanisms you can. But we can't dictate that, mechan that, that, that behavior. This is sorry, and this is what I mean. Fire won't solve the all clinical problems. I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm not. I'm not joking, and I'm not, you know, taking the so, mickey. But so, this is the whole point. Fire will not solve all these problems. It simply helps you deal with some of the common stuff, but you've still got to deal with some of the other issues. So, so, so from my, my clinical perspective, I'd find it much, much more value to have attributes to confirm that told me on the basis of which. That, that fact was confirmed. So if it was diagnosis, it might be on the history, it might be on histology, it might be imaging. It would be much more useful to have that yeah. rather than to have a, a, whole, so, a whole lot of information about what was excluded. So there's an evidence property on condition that you could use for that, yeah. And you might even go further. You might, you might say that um, there might be other elements you want to add as extensions, but you know, look at what, if you look at what's in there first, it may well meet your meet your needs. And that would also tell you who had done that and the date. Uh, if you look at this particular one, it does not have that under evidence. The yeah, well, the detail the detail has a reference. No, it doesn't actually have the person. But if you wanted to do that, if you felt that it was important, you would create an extension on evidence which would have the person and potentially an extension that would have the date as well. So you could do that if you felt to be put. Again, if we come back to a comment I made right at the very beginning, and that was the rule of 80%, is that stuff only made its way into the core spec if 80% of people were already doing it. Because what happened with V3, V3 went the other way. V3 said, here's all the stuff that anybody could ever want to do it, and by the way, you really should do this. And we came up with enormous size models that were very hard to understand. So that's why we've gone down the line of keeping them small, but letting you add the bits in there that you feel are important in your domain. So, so I think one of, the, one of the answers to verification status problem is to have implementation guidance, which can be, if you don't send us verification status, we will default it to be confirmed. No. Or unknown? No, you, that's, uh, sorry, but I don't mean to be rude. Um, okay, you, fine, go ahead. <laughs> um, you, you can't, one of, the, one of the things is that uh, an implementation guy can do a number of things in terms of saying what values are, but it's got to be explicit. We, we, we don't let you say that if there's nothing there, you can assume that it's normal. You've got to be explicit about it. Right, so you have to send confirmed. Correct. Right, so, okay, so the way to rephrase is that, a system supplier, when they are sending it, they have to put it either confirmed or one of the value sets, but they can still default, default to confirm unless they find it in their system they got something like refuted. Well, that's a decision that the vendor makes. Yeah. So if I, if, I, if I know that the way I designed my system, I only ever stuck in stuff that was confirmed, or if it wasn't confirmed, I put it in explicitly, why then yes, I can. But as a recipient, I'm not allowed to assume that if nothing's there, it must mean this. Yeah. So, so this is some of the details that we're going to face. Remember, we're not here to yeah. solve those problems, right? Those problems will exist in a lot of these different technologies. So is it now profiling next or...? Yeah, okay. So now we're on to the techie stuff. So um, again, I do emphasize this is, this is now technical. 
Um, this is what you would expect the fire experts to be dealing with, not the clinical folk. But the whole concept of profiling is all about the idea that we want to be able to use the same set of resources in different places. So, for example, a resource to indicate blood pressure in a GP's practice probably just needs to say systolic, diastolic, maybe whether the patient was sitting or standing, but in a GP practice you, you probably wouldn't even bother with that. In an ICU, you want to go into a whole lot more detail. But we want to have the same observation resource in this case. So there needs to be a way to be able to describe how to use resources and what can be in those resources based on the context. And to be able to have these in a structured way, uh, in a published way, and to use them as a basis for validation. So if we decide to take the example we were talking about before, the validation, I'm sorry, of the um, verification status on a condition, is you might decide that it's required, and you might want a way to be able to test that any resource that comes in meets that, uh, meet, meets that requirement, that it is actually there. And there's three, ma and, oh, and inter interesting enough, tools such as ClinFire actually use those resources to generate the user interface, which is a comment about the um, generating the UI. There's broadly, and uh, only broadly, three things you do when you're profiling. The first is to constrain a resource. And in that, you take stuff out that you're not using. You change the multiplicity of something within some rules. I'll talk about it in a second. And you can fix values. When you fix a value, what you're saying is, to be conformant, the value should be this. You're not saying, if it's absent, assume that it's this. You're simply saying, um, you're fixing a value. The most common one, and the one that's used in, um, you guys have done in Care Connect, is for the NHI. So there is a, a field there that says this is a, um, a, an NHI number, and to be an NHI number, the system should be this URI, which is the, which is the, um, the NRI. NHS number. Oh, I'm sorry, NHS, NHS number. Um, the multiplicity, there are some rules. You cannot make something which is required in the spec optional in your profile. You cannot say that something which is single in the spec is multiple in your profile. And you can... Uh, yeah, they're the main ones, I yeah. think. There might be others. Um, so effectively, profiling is a statement of use of resources. How you are using resources and what are the changes you're making. And these are the kind of things that you would commonly do. Um, oh yes, make a single, multi make a multiple single. That was the one I was missing. So you could potentially say that, um, that the identifier for a patient must come from the, must be an NHS and is required. Or you, yeah. What was the star again, David? Star means multiple. Star means there can be more than one. You can limit the names to just one. So name and the spec can be multiple. You might want to say that we only want one of them. Change a value set for, say, marital status, provided this is not required. Take out photo and add an extension to support, say, ethnicity. So again, broadly, those are the things you do with profiling. You can actually do quite a bit more but that gets real techy real fast. There are a number of conformance resources in, 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 in FIRE, and again, I, I do point out these as, this is technical. The structure definition is the resource that we use to define the contents of, a, of an actual resource type. So that's what ClinFire was doing when we were building those models, is that it was reading the structure definition in order to know what elements it could place on the screen and you could do exactly the same thing in your profiles. Uh, the value set, we've already talked about quite extensively. The implementation guide is what wraps everything together into a coherent whole. We'll have a look at that in a second. The code system, concept map, and naming systems are fairly detailed. Um, the code system is, is the codes that we looked at before, like SNOMED. Concept map lets you map between um, code systems, and the naming system defines an identifier, a system for an identifier, amongst other things. So a structured definition is the jargon we use in FIRE to define the definition of that resource or the profiled version of that resource. Correct, correct. It's the FIRE jargon. 
Yeah. Okay, it's called a structure definition. Um, some examples, we're familiar with that. So a, a profile, when we talk about the word profile, which we throw around quite a lot, a profile is a horribly overused word. But in this particular case, what we mean is that we have taken a single resource, like condition, and we have modified it to meet our needs within the boundaries that we've talked about. As we've said, under the hood, it is defined by the structure definition resource, which the whole of fire is based on. Is the term eating your own dog food, is that used in the UK? It was already a disgusting New Zealand one, okay. Um, so basically what that's supposed to be saying is that the, the profiling mechanism that you can use to define your profiles is exactly the same as the whole fire spec is based upon. And to find each element, including all the components of the element, there are a number of ways you can build it. The forge tooling kit is the, is the recommended way of doing it. Clinfire can do bits, but really if you're doing serious stuff, um, forge would be the tool to use, which I believe is what you're using in the, in the UK. So for developers. Really. Yeah, it's, it's a developer's tool. Yeah, wouldn't expect the clinicians to be using it. Um, extension definitions. So, and I touched on this before. Every time you add an extension to, or you define an extension, we've talked about race, we've talked about a number of different things, you must create, again, a structure definition which defines exactly what's inside that, that extension, what the extension actually means. Um, and the purpose of that, of course, is so that a recipient can always find what the meaning of an extension is. An extension can be simple or it can be complex. And again, you've used this in the UK. I might actually move, I'm going to, I'm going to jump sideways for just a little bit. I'm going to go back into, into ClinFire. And I think, I do hope I have this on my own system. I think, I think I do, yes. So these are the Care Connect profiles. So what I... So they're interopen. We, we need to just clarify. They're the term that interopen is used to define sort of a set of UK generic profiles for patient or condition or allergy based on the international spec. So it's a profile of it, exactly what yeah. um, David's been talking about. And we've, we've called it Care Connect to sort of connect up the care system. It, it came out of GP Connect started first, which is just, just connect between GPs. But we decided to use the term Care Connect. That, that's the history of it. Yeah. So this is uh, the implementation guide viewer. Uh, again, is something which lets you look at the various artifacts which have been created as part of profiling. So technically, what I did is these are all created, I think, by the NHS, if, I, if I'm correct, or, or yeah, think. community people. Sa saved onto a, onto, a, onto a server, and I was able to pick those up, wrap them up in an implementation guide, and put them on a server so that you can have a look at it. So if we want to go and have a look at a profile, if we look at the profile on patient, for example, OK, is it type with no code? I need to talk to you about that. Um, so if we go and look at the tree view of that, so what we see is this is this is um, Clinfire's way of showing you what a profiled resource looks like. There are others, and again, one of the values of, of using something like Fire is that you can have different renditions of the same thing. So in this case, we've got all of the um, uh, all of the elements that that are part of the core spec here, but here are your extensions. So this is what's been added, or been proposed to be added, by Care Connect. It's not been verified and clinically validated yet. Just to put that out one, there. One step, one okay. step on the way, sorry. Yeah. So for example, we actually have religious affiliation as being an extension. And so it's shown there against patient, it's purple, and there's the definition of it right there. So that tells you, um, okay, yeah, my terminology server doesn't yeah, have this, because I'm on the wrong one. Um, but you can get the idea uh, of how an extension is, is an addition to the um, thing. And the point I wanted to make here is if we look at this one here, we will see that this is a complex extension. So this is additional registration. Um, let me just click on the link to get the description. Additional registration information, and it includes the registration period, the type, and the status. So when you're creating an extension, you can create quite complex structures if you want to. I just kind of wanted to show that because I think it kind of made a bit of sense to do it there. 
um, definition. The definition itself needs to be available on the web so that someone can find it. Ideally, the actual URL that's there, it's like a web page URL, you should be able to type that into a browser and get the definition back. Alternatively, it gets, or, and even in addition, it gets saved on a registry such as Simplifier. But whatever, it needs to be available for a recipient to look at. People don't know what Simplifier is. You might want to just explain that. I'd rather not go into too much oh, detail. Yeah, can, I just, can I just say that the, so basically, there needs to be a way to a, to a vendor that the uh, extension definition can be located, um, which is the important part. In the resource instance, there needs to be a reference to that extension definition, again, as I've just talked about. Again, so that this is the point. The recipient can always find out the definition. And I just want to point out that um, it is most of the time, if you don't know what an extension is, you should be able to ignore it. So if I, for example, have added an extension to patient, which is religious affiliation, but I don't know what religious affiliation means, it almost certainly suggests that I'm not storing it, so I can safely ignore it. There might be information which could be useful to me, but it's not going to change the meaning of the resource. There are times when you want to add an extension which it is unsafe to ignore. For example, you might want to create a medication resource that the patient should not take. A medication statement. So you might want to create an extension which says, don't take this medication. If I don't understand what that means, it's clinically unsafe. And so for that, there is a thing called a modifier extension. And that's just the same thing, just has a different name in the resource. But what that means is that a recipient that receives a resource which has got a modifier extension in it must have a strategy to deal with it. We don't define what that strategy is. That's up to the implementation. It might be something like, you know, display a message on the screen saying they sent me this and I don't know what it means. Or you might decide to reject it, but they must have some kind of strategy for it. So a fire client actually has to look for and make sure that they process properly modifier extensions. And you should use them carefully and cautiously and think long and hard before you decide to use them. But they are out there and I did want to point it out. The last thing I really wanted to show you is, um, and I've kind of touched on it, is this implementation guide. Uh, so this was just a tool that lets you look at at, at, at what's in the in the guide. I, I, I tend to use the patient as yeah. being the the one. So, uh, so, so implementation guide is a phrase. Some people think it's a, okay. a document that talks about how it's used. But could you want to explain what, how you we've had this debate? Yep. yep. Good point. So in Fire, there is an explicit resource which is an implementation guide. And that implementation guide has got sections that allow you to explicitly reference the various internal artifacts that are needed um, to define a particular implementation. So rather than just being a, a Word document of some sort, it actually has links directly to the, the artifacts that you need. So you can be completely explicit about what it is that you are sharing. So like profiles, value sets? Any, the, any conformance it, artifacts. It, when I first heard the term, I thought well, it's a document that tells me how to use these as a yeah. human readable PDF word. But that's not what David's oh. referring to. He's referring to a fire artifact where it's like a resource that explicitly connects all the different value sets that you've defined, the profiles you've defined. Yep. And what David's done is he's used that to show us all the care connects interactions and the value sets. Now you can, so there's it's actually... It's not a Word document. It's not a such. Word document. Okay. So the, the, there's tooling in there. So there, for example, is the Argonaut profile. So this has been done out of the specification. It's a US set of this like, is the care US, connect for yeah. US. And so they're using the same underlying infrastructure, but there's the profile on care plan, for example. Um, uh, various bits and pieces in there. So all I've done is I've done, it's another viewer, it's on the same thing. And again, I come back to this, one of the values is that, of FIRE is that because we've got this predefined set of infrastructure, we can do our own views. So this is, this is my own one for patients. So this one here is showing in a graphical form um, the, uh, the profiles care against CareConnect, that's CareConnect patient. 
Um, I can include the value sets in that view. So that lets you look at all the different value sets. You can link on them to, yeah. oh, okay, I've, I'm, I'm looking That's at the, oh no, there we go. There's the, um, the server and so forth. So it's just a way of browsing the value set. And the idea is what I'd like to do is to make this so that, again, a clinician can look at this and it's in clinician speak so they can understand what these things are, but they can also you know, interactively dive into it. So again, as we talked about gender, there's the binding, what's in the binding. So, um, so the way I see this working, Tony, and you mentioned earlier about at what point do you generate an output. So I, 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 at the moment I see Kimfire helping us take those models, helping us map it, creating those views, yeah. but then ultimately we then hand it over to the fire experts who use Forge yeah. to actually construct those structure definitions and those value sets put them in a GitHub repository that has version controlling on HL7, so the HL7 UK affiliate, and then David will go and suck out those structured definitions and put them on here yep. as a whole guide. So that's when you could also get other clinicians or you can look at it when it's all been done as a version one, for example. So you could use it like that. We might want to potentially add a feature where people can comment. Mm -hmm. But that commentary at the moment is happening in a workshop basis where you get the clinicians, clinical safety, terminal, and we're trying to all agree what the Care Connect profile might look like. But further down the line, we might have other features where we have commentary, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know. But I, would, I see that the, the implementation guide viewer is once we've done a version 101 or 1.0, we load them here for clinicians to have a look because it's got that map. It's got the ability to delve into it for those who were a bit more interested from these structured definitions, these viewers. So these are the ways that we can use this tooling at the moment in its current iteration. Yep. And, and we shouldn't go into too much no, detail no, about that. No, I so, think we're done. So, <coughs> so uh, let's go no, isn't that a perfect way to share the stuff? So as, people develop, as people develop these things, they could lay them on here. And you, you may have the same subject matter, but you could then at least then compare across to see how similar people are. I and, and I think there's there's a lot of what, what I'd like to do. You know, there's, there's no right answer for any of these things at the moment. <laughs> over, no. over time, definitions yeah. will appear which people generally agree with, but we're not there yet. So anyone doing stuff about defining stuff yeah. will be helpful because it'll just get the population of people to understand the subject matter. Yeah, indeed. Well, I, I think there's a number of different ways. As I, I touched on Simplifier before, there is an international fire registry for putting these stuff as well. So we, we should look at that. But I think we're now at the stage where, because we're so early, there's nothing wrong with trying several different ways, maybe even both at the same time, because we can all talk to each other under the hood, that's the beauty of, of this, um, and present it in different ways, see what works, yeah. and what works for us. Yeah. So. Uh, <clears throat> just to clarify, when I talked about implementation guidance earlier, I meant much broader than, I think this is really helpful, but at the same time, when we issue implementation guidance, we have to be very specific about how the senders and receivers would behave when they're sending information. So from my context, I think in this workshop, we, we got four layers. What is what you described as a fire capability. We talk about a little bit of terminology capability, which sometimes competes with fire capability, and we haven't talked about it. <coughs> the third layer is system capability, which Dermot has talked about, and how that is managed by fire and terminology. And the fourth layer is the clinical behavior. So I think when we issue implementation guidance, we have to take everything account and clinical safety. I think I, that's a bigger piece. I, I, I absolutely agree. One of the things that the implementation guide allows you to do, and I don't have the time to do it here, but you can put references to those documents within the guide. So uh, by, uh, you'd probably put those up on the web anywhere, but in your implementation guide you provide links to them. So when you go to the guide, you've got an index to all of that documentation. You're quite right. It's not just the structured artifacts. It's all of the other um, information and documentation around it as well. And I think it's really important that all of that goes into one place. Or at least there's an index to it in one place. Because the reality is the stuff will be on different servers around the, around the world. Right. So I'm going to wrap up. Yep. That's OK. So. Um, if you look around, look at colleagues, this is pretty full room for a very in deep dive into fire. Thank you very much for all staying to the end and you know, you, you've been so engaged. This has been a really tough 
challenging workshop. So I felt like you've had to go through what I've had about a year and a half to go through <laughs> in a day. So if your brain is a bit bubbling and feeling like jelly, that's a really good sign because it's been worked hard. <laughs> okay. And I know that you've all been really, you've all been great in sort of focusing and the minimal emails that you've done. Well, thank you very much. We will record, we will distribute the content. We will bring out some examples. People will share this. And um, certificates for those who um, need them will be issued after you fill out a survey monkey, which we will send to you in due course. That's the, uh, that's the deal we have. Um, Please could you show your appreciation to David Hay, who's come all the way to, to give us this workshop and explain to us how we use bioclinically. We really, um, uh, it, it, honestly, David's worked so hard to, uh, to evangelize fire and you know, we, we, sh we actually are indebted to his um, skills in bringing out Climfire and we have used a lot of his knowledge in the UK and we hope to have him back hopefully potentially next mm. year for another okay. workshop yep. if not it might be me and you'll be unlucky <laughs> sorry we could even go to New Zealand but I'm not sure Ryan Health is going to fund that part <laughs> so um, 10 minutes early but please um, you know, stretch your legs and um, go and enjoy some drinks and some networking. And thank you all very much for attending. Um, this clinician's on fire. Thank you. Sure.